Happy Sabbath. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Amen. Let me add my welcome. We're glad that you are joining us, and we want you to join us in singing. If you have your hymnal app, or if you have a hymnal, we're going to sing number 44. <clears throat> and we have some brave people that are going to help us sing. You guys be sure and stand a little ways apart now. And uh, our opening song is Morning Has Broken, number 44. Number 44. for opening prayer. Father, it is good to come to the house of the Lord, whether that be the Udawal Church here from which this program is being broadcasted this morning, or whether that be our living room, our kitchen, our bedroom, wherever it is that we pause to worship and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for the many promises you give us during times of uncertainty. And we think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. 
We thank you that we have no reason to fear because you walk with us mm -hmm. through that valley of the difficult time. Lord, we thank you that you came to give us hope and that through Jesus Christ, the future is guaranteed regard regardless of what twists and turns uh, history takes. And this morning, we want to go on record and say, we trust you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for your goodness. We pray that you would pour your spirit out upon Pastor Peter as he shares the word of life, that you would bless the word, that it might become the living word to strike us in the heart where we need to hear it. We pray that you would bless the Sabbath school lesson, the music, the singing. May it all lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we be drawn to you this morning. John 12, 32 says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all people to me. So please draw us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, how I want to say, why don't you stand up and greet one another and shake hands with one another, but we will not be doing that this morning. And uh, I know that we'll be praying for one another and we'll be waving to one another and calling one another and posting encouraging messages on Facebook, text messages. There are so many ways Let's be creative in staying connected as a church. We are still a church. This is our church, and we'll continue worshiping the Lord no matter what. Uh, we still have announcements this morning, and there are a few things that I would like to share with you. First is that right after this worship service, after the sermon, will transition into the Sabbath school study. So you are welcome to continue watching and we'll have a discussion of the Sabbath school lesson right here at this table and you're welcome to join. If you would prefer direct interaction, you can use Zoom app on your phone or on your computer and uh, there will be a, a Zoom Sabbath school class Sounds strange, of course, but we live in a strange time. And uh, so you're welcome to participate. It's an open Sabbath school class. And um, uh, I shared with you instructions about how to be in that Zoom class last week. So if you go to my last week's uh, blog post, there's the whole page with the instructions and the meeting ID. So you can be a part of that live discussion of that Sabbath school class. I don't know for sure, but I believe the youth class will also be using Zoom uh, for their Sabbath school study at about 10, uh, 10, 15, 10, 20 this morning. And I talked to the other Sabbath school teachers, especially of the lower divisions, and they are also looking into creative ways of being connected with their class because we do care about our little ones and we want to know that they can study and, and interact and sing together. So hopefully we will have more information uh, in the next few days and I will be sharing that through my blog or on church Facebook and on the church website. So this is the time when we are using our social media and web resources like never before. So go to our web resources and you will be informed because I want everyone to know what's happening, what to expect. I do not expect that we will have a worship service in our regular traditional way of coming together next week. So I'm talking about the first Sabbath of April. That will probably not happen. We'll continue worshiping in the online format. We'll continue worshiping in our hearts and minds being united by the Spirit of God. We'll know later on. Um, we'll see how things progress and hopefully Things will improve and we'll again be together. And I want you to keep praying about it. And as you are praying, 
I'll remind you, we have a prayer chain where you can send your prayer requests. If you don't have their phone number, use my cell phone number, which is 678-571-1743, and send me your prayer requests. Uh, our pastoral staff will be praying. I will be sharing those prayer requests with the prayer chain. I welcome your prayers. Pastor Matthew welcomes your prayers. So let's all be praying for one another. That prayer will, keeps, uh, will keep us united as a church. So don't forget about that. But um, our board meeting and our finance committee meetings will also be this coming Monday in regular times, but on Zoom. And board members, uh, they have received uh, some information, but there will be more coming specific uh, meeting ID number will be coming on Monday morning to your email address. So please don't forget to check your email on Monday morning for the board members and the finance committee members. Uh, this week we'll start our midweek Bible study online also. So on Wednesday at 7 p.m. I will be leading the prayer meeting the same format. So please go to the church website, Facebook, or just click on the links and be a part of our Wednesday 7 p.m. Uh, time when we will study God's Word and we will we'll be praying. And you can use my cell phone again on Wednesday night. I want it to be live. I want you to be able to send your prayer requests, participate in the prayer meeting. So uh, before you had an excuse, it was late, you didn't want to drive, and uh, you were tired. Now you can do it from home. So no excuses. I'm inviting the whole church to join us for the prayer meeting on Wednesday 7 p.m. using same links that you use for the worship service time. Now, I know you know that we need to support our church. So at uh, this time, I wanted to say, deacons, please come and pass out the tithes envelopes. But we can take those tithes envelopes to your homes. So if you need a tithes envelope, we can deliver it to the porch of your home uh, so just call the office or text me and we will make arrangements for you to have the tithe envelope. And of course, you can do that all online using our church website, contributing to the work of our church worldwide as well as locally here in our own church. We'll have a children's story just in a few minutes here. And um, actually... Uh, we have a different format this morning, so this is the time now to ask for the, for the offerings. And I will remind you that we all are participating. Some of you, I know, have already contributed online last night or this morning. It's okay to get your phones right now if you're watching from home or get online and open Adventist giving and support the ministry of our church because this is how we will continue to function and your contributions go to support our school, uh, our academy students, it goes to pay our utility bills and to continue to preach the gospel because nothing should ever stop the preaching of the gospel. So thank you for being so supportive, faithful, and generous. I did see a number of you driving by the church office yesterday. That was on Friday. There is a box on the wall mounted right to that brick wall next to the office door. And many of you were dropping your tithe envelopes into that box. And uh, you noticed that I had my office outside. I took my desk and my chair outside. It was a beautiful day yesterday. And I was working on my sermon and on my blog uh, yesterday being outside. One of the reasons I wanted to see how many of you would use that mailbox, of course. <laughs> but also being outside was amazing. Uh, let's pray for the Lord to bless our giving. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that this church is faithful in supporting your work. Lord, we know that um, there are many who are losing jobs. There are many who cannot continue going to their offices. 
But Lord, we know also that uh, your work will continue no matter what. And if we have little, Lord, we want to bring whatever we have to support your work. If we have more, Lord, encourage us to contribute even more, even more generously. Because there are so many people today who need to find hope in you. Bless our church, wherever they are, Lord. This, this is your church. And bless their giving and their support of the gospel proclamation in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And while you are contributing, we usually in the church here have an offer to worry, but we would like to sing a song here that we hope is a blessing. Because Jesus says to depend on him. He says, depend on me when things aren't exactly right. And that's the name of this song. When the hopes you had has disappeared, and you've lost your will to try and you think your ship has just come in but it keeps on passing by when you've almost gained the victory and you've left the rest behind and the marathon has slowed its pace as you reach the finish line and you round the final corner but you fall, depend on me. Depend on me. Depend on me when your world has led you down. Depend on me. Depend on me when your love has been denied, when you've lost your earthly pride, you can depend on me. When your life is filled with emptiness and your friends have said goodbye and the hill becomes a mountain as your troubles multiply when your trials get too much to bear and you're standing all alone and the feeling way down deep inside is the worst you've ever known and you need someone to Depend on me. Depend on me. Depend on me. When the world has let you down, depend on me. When you feel your losing ground, Depend on me when your love has been denied, when you've lost your earthly pride, you can depend on me. Depend on me when the world has let you down, depend on me. When it feel your losing ground, depend on me. When your love has been denied, when you've lost your earthly pride, you can depend on me.
now we would like to invite you to sing with us. This is our worship through singing, and uh, I'm very happy for a small group that's going to help out here. But I guess before we do that, we, we've got something special something for the special kids, special. right? All right. Remember, yes. Uh, parents, bring your little ones to your iPads, your computers, your phones. I know usually you don't want your little ones to be around your phones, but this may be the time. And now I will know that we'll have a great story, and Rhonda has something special to share with us. Good morning. So this has been a crazy couple of weeks. <laughs> and um, not going to lie, if you turn on the news, <laughs> you just and, and all my patients are talking about it, you're just bombarded with negativity and just all the things that could go wrong. <laughs> and. Um, Every day my boss comes in and she's trying to decide if we're going to close the clinic or we're going to keep it open. So naturally I started worrying. <laughs> and um, I started to think, well, what does God have to say about worry? And so I started looking up some verses. And one of the verses that I came up to was, can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 25, which was, worry weighs you down. It weighs you down. And I got to thinking about backpacking. I have only gone backpacking one time. That's another children's story. Very long weekend for me. But that's another children's story. Before we take the Pathfinders out, we tell them how to pack their backpack. And we pretty much tell them, don't carry heavy items. Carry only what you need. Well, we're getting out of our cars, and um, one of the little girls, bless her heart, had packed enough food to feed us all. But not only that, it was canned food. <laughs> so her backpack was very, very heavy. It was about a mile and a half into where we were going to camp. And so she's trugging along, and she, it's just weighing her down, and it's getting harder and harder for her to carry her backpack. And it just reminds me, worry. If you're carrying the worries, it's just going to weigh you down. So OK, so now I know worry weighs your heart down. So what do I do with it? Well. There's another verse, 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your worries on God, and he'll help carry them. So we'll get back to the story. So I want to um, illustrate how worry weighs you down. So I have this can of worry, OK? It's just all full of worries. and it weighs you down, and it drowns you. But now, I'm going to empty my can of worries and just give it to God, and he gives me peace. And my load is light. Because I've given it to him. So back to this backpacking trip. So the little girl is really, really struggling to get to the campsite. And our leaders took turns 
carrying her backpack for her into the campsite. And it just, that whole picture just reminded me how we can just give our worries to God, and he's going to carry them because he loves us so much. And, I mean, I think it just fits so well with the song that we just heard, Depend on Me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us so much that you're willing to just carry our burdens and our worries, and we can give them to you and know that we're safe and you are going to protect us and that you love us so much that your ultimate goal is for us to be with you, not to destroy us. Help us to remember that and give us peace during this time of uncertainty. In your name, amen. Okay, now it's time for you to join us. And uh, if you have your hymnal or your hymnal app, we're going to be singing number eight. Number eight in your hymnal. And this song, we usually sing it at Thanksgiving time. And, uh, but what a better time to sing it than now. We gather together, even if it is around computer screens. We feel a little bit uh, closed in sometimes, don't we? Um, we're going to sing one more song, and we hope that maybe you know a lot of part of this anyway by memory. It's called Wonderful Peace, and uh, if you turn in your book to 466, you'll find the hymn there. And we're going to sing stanzas one and two. Peace, peace, wonderful peace. <laughs> Spirit for 
so secure that no power can find it away. All the years of eternity roll. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down. Our scripture today is found in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. spoke the words and all the worlds came into order. You waved your hands and planets filled the empty skies. You placed the woman and the man inside the garden. And though they felt they found compassion in your stand amazed at the wonder of your deeds and yet a greater wonder brings me to my knees lord i praise you because of who you are not for all the mighty things that you have done Because of who 
This morning, as we are opening God's Word, I would like us to remember those who are in hospitals, those who lost their dear ones, their family members, those who may be here in the United States or in Italy or in Spain or in Ukraine. We know that this world needs a miracle. And we will pray that the Lord will give us the answer. It is very confusing. It is very strange. But I know God hears our prayers today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we are here opening your word, we pray, Lord, that you give us hope. Lord, give us assurance that you are still in charge, you are still in control, this is your world. Lord, we are praying about those who are infected with the virus. We are praying about those who are in the hospitals in Italy, or in New York, or in California, or in Madrid in Spain, or in Ukraine in uh, Eastern Europe. Lord, all over the world, people are losing hope. And we want, Lord, to look at you and to hear your word and to ask, Lord, for the abundance of your grace to be poured out into this world. Give us assurance, Lord, that you are with us still today and with those that are suffering, with those that are struggling, with those that lost their income, lost their jobs. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I have my phone with me, so if you have prayer requests, I invite you to text your prayer requests, 678, area code 571-1743. We will be praying more. We'll pray after the message, and I know God hears our prayers, and He's willing to answer He is a wonderful God, and in spite of the fact that our world is is a strange place right now, and we cannot explain many things that are happening around us, for me, that's another lesson. Just imagine that months ago I was preaching a sermon, and I would say in my sermon that in March... You will not be allowed to come and worship in our church or that in the month of March, churches will be closed all across the world. You would say Pastor Peter had a nightmare and he did not sleep well or he's really confused. But this is the reality of the present day. We don't like it. We hate it. But this is what we see around us. And once again, it proves to me how fluid this world is. There is nothing permanent in this world. Things are changing. And some of the things that seem to be so solid and so permanent and so eternal, they crumble just in a few hours. And we know that there's always been people saying, Where is your God and how will your God come? I know that today as we look at our world, once again we see that whatever seems to us eternal and permanent in this world will fail. But God will never fail. And God will be with us. I know we are confused. And I know we cannot understand and explain many things happening in the political world or with our finances, or with our jobs, or with our beloved church. Look at that. You are worshiping at home. And we wonder why and how long will that continue. But I know that God has a plan for His church. And His plan for His church is very powerful. Remember in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 16, as Christ was having a conversation with his disciples, and then Peter acknowledges him as as the Lord and the Savior, in Matthew chapter 16, then the Lord 
is speaking about his church. And he says uh, that his church will be a strong church. Verse 18, Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, the Lord says. The Lord is talking about his church. There is God's church. There are our churches, but there is God's church. And, and, and there is something else that he says here. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It seems to us that some virus is prevailing over our church. And it may be so when we are thinking about our church, about that concept that is, that's been ingrained in our mind and in our mindset, in our theology about our church. When we are talking about our church, yes, it seems like the virus, the fear, panic is prevailing. But Christ is talking about his church. And he says that even, even hell itself, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. What kind of church is Christ talking about? Definitely not the kind of church that we are used to because uh, we, we grew up coming to church once a week. We, we are so accustomed, we are so used to coming to church and worshiping God and having our church at a certain address. At a certain, on a certain street and, and we come to that property, we come to that building and we call it church and we worship here and we spend an hour with God, sort of like, uh, I, I'm not so much into football games, but my, my, some of my extended family, they love to watch football games. And as I watch at the screen of the TV while they are so excited watching and all those players running on the field, I see that there is just a very few running and doing something and everyone else, and I'm talking about thousands and thousands of people, are just sitting, eating popcorn and enjoying that. And it seems to them they are a part of that game, but they are not. They are simply the observers and then they go home and it seems to them they won the game. They did not. Those players who were actually running, those that were kicking the ball, they were the ones who either lost or won the game. But we live in that culture when we come to church and it seems to us we are participating in the ministry of the church when we are sitting on our comfortable chairs, having great friends around us, listening to wonderful music that is presented to us. And then as we finish the service, like all those fans of all those football clubs, we drive home saying, I've been to church. And that's not the kind of church that Christ is talking about. He says, my church will stand. My church will stand through the difficult times. My church may not be fancy. And my church may not have high ceilings or fancy walls or nice chairs or pews. And I've seen lots of churches where people worship in uh, shacks or warehouses and no air conditioning and no heating and they come into those rented facilities they come to a very humble place to worship i was in eastern ukraine not so long ago and as i remember i arrived there we rented a, an auditorium for our meetings that even that rented auditorium downtown on the third floor with no elevator, no cooling in the middle of summer was like, like what Jesus is saying, that the gates of Hades, you know, that was like hell, basically. Sorry for saying it. It was so hot. People were passing out from that heat. 
But then the pastor takes me and he says, I want you to show you our church. And, and he drives me to a very small street there. And, and there is something sort of almost like in the ground, uh, some abandoned old small warehouse, all ugly and uh, looking so sad. And he says, we cannot afford a nice building. We don't have a nice church facility, but this is what we use as, as our church. And I was there with the pastor, and we prayed there. And I tell you, I could feel the presence of Christ right there in that, in that ugly building because Christ does not care about the structure. He cares about his church, which is way more than what we are used to to see as his church in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 here I see as Christ through Paul is helping me understand this whole concept in verse 16 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 he says do you not know that you are the temple of God he says he's not talking to a congregation that gathered together and he's not saying to them he's talking to every believer individually and he says do you not know that you are the temple of God and that's a totally different concept to what we are used to understand as God's church and I believe we we are at the in that Point, at that point in the history of our world when we need to rethink our church. We, we need to look at our, our own life, our spiritual life, and to ask ourselves, what is church for me? What is church for my family? What is church for my ministry? And that's why Paul is making that very powerful statement. He's saying, do you not know have you not understood that, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And if the Spirit of God dwells in you, that I am God's church. I am the church that God needs. And this is that spiritual body that is all over the world. We are concerned about the general conference of our church being postponed. We love when when people come together and we, are, we take pride in our Seventh-day Adventist church. We take pride in our institutions and Loma Linda Hospital and Andrews University and Southern Adventist University and we, our schools and academies and all those wonderful buildings. But today when they are closed, Christ is saying, you are my church. So when people are asking you today, where is your church? I hope when we hear the words of Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, we'll start saying, I am the sanctuary of Christ. I am the temple where God dwells. And I am here to do God's work. I am here to continue the ministry. Because it is Christ, as Paul again in Ephesians, Chapter 2, verse 21, he is helping me see that this is not the church that I built. This is actually the church that Christ is working on. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, he says, In whom, that is in Christ, the whole building, the whole building, he's talking about his body, his church, his sanctuary, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So remember, you are the temple of God, and if you are the temple of God, that it is Christ who is building you. It is Christ who is fitting you to find your place in the ministry of His church that is a universal church, that is a worldwide church and that whole structure that that has God's people in China and India and Bangladesh and the United States of America they are being fitted together being different 
being of a different color, speaking different languages, having different cultures, but they are being fitted together. It is when we realize God is at work in my life. And I believe this is the time for us to acknowledge that we were thinking we are doing the church. We are building the church. And it is okay to do our part, but let us always remember that's God's work. And God needs me, not just bricks, not just the blocks, not just the two by fours. God needs me as his church to fit us all together for his purpose to be fulfilled and completed. But this is the place where the Spirit of God dwells. And when God is building something, that is different from everything else. Nothing can be compared to what God is doing. And if we were taking pride in our church, and I am, I'm saying, this is a wonderful church. Ultua Seventh-day Adventist Church is an amazing church. But now it is time for us to come to the Lord as individuals, as individual sanctuaries that God is putting together and to say, Lord, now we want to be your holy temple. Because what God is doing, it is holy always. It is different. It is set aside. It is, it is, it is not, nothing like anything we can do with our own hands. It is God's holy temple. Remember in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, when Solomon is praying about the new temple that had been erected there, that, that amazing, that gorgeous structure, and he's praying to the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. That's when he's asking an important question, or actually, I would say, he is making a powerful statement right there, 1 Kings chapter 8. He is saying in verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? He says, Is earth enough for the presence of the Lord? Can it fit him? Behold heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. He's saying what, whatever God is doing, it is different from anything that we can do. And there is no way that we can contain God in our pretty nice church that we keep for ourselves. And that's the time for us to realize we've been living with this idea that we need to just come together and keep God to ourselves in our pretty nice church and contain God by our church because the world is evil, the world is suffering, there's so much sin and there's so much darkness in the world. Let's quarantine our God in our church. Because we don't want God to see the ugliness of this church. So we keep God in our sanctuary. And it seems to us we are doing a good job by keeping God within the walls of our churches. And then we keep God to ourselves. And, and it seems to us, yes, we, we are good with God. We're good with one another. We, we all look okay in the eyes of the Lord that this is our haven this is our shelter we come to our church we worship God we spend time with one another but then we need to go into the real world and at that point we sort of want to leave our God in the walls of our church and, and we do a good job by keeping the Holy Spirit within the walls of our church, but then when we go outside, we sort of are saying, God, you keep my chair. God, you warm my pew, and I will come back, we are saying to the Lord. I will come back the next week, and I will worship you again, but Lord, I'm glad you are here, but now I need to go into the real world, into my life, and do my job, and to do all my responsibilities that I have, but I will come again. And for us, that became church. That became the whole idea of church. When, when we come for one hour 
and when we leave the church behind and go into the real world. That's not the kind of God and that's not the kind of church that I want us to have. Because Solomon is asking God, can this church contain you? Can the walls of this church contain you? And now when we are crying that our churches are closed and we cannot worship together as a congregation, I believe this is the time for us to realize that God is in this world. God is in the hospitals. He is in the emergency room. He is in the homes of those who lost their income and lost their job. He is in our communities. And that's, and that's where he needs his church. That's where he needs me as his sanctuary. And if anyone these days asks you, where is your church, Peter? I want to tell them, my church is my home address. My church is my life. And then I know there will be startled because, you know, again, that mindset of our day and our time. If you say, my church is in my home, they see that as a cult. They see that as something so strange. If you talk about a nice building, a nice structure, then it's fine. But if it is in your heart, in your life, in your family, that sounds so strange. But let us show to the world that we are the temple of God, that we are that ecclesia that was the early church. And actually the word itself, that Greek word ecclesia, initially the whole meaning was someone called out, called out, someone who is called out to go out. And I am sure Christ loves to be out. So this is the time to let Jesus out of our church building. Let him go into Ultawa. Let him go into College Dale. Let Jesus finally go into our neighborhoods. Let him go into our subdivisions. Let him go into our offices if they are open still or when they will open eventually. Let Jesus be out there with us because we are the called out ones. As his church, we are called out to go into this world and to shine and to bring the light and to bring the salt and to be where we are needed more than anything else today we are called out to be where the need is and I believe this is the time this is high time for us to rethink our church and to say God needs us where darkness is because that's where we need to shine God needs us where the suffering is. There are so many confused people around us. And it's so easy to, to start a conversation. And that's why not only we are being built by God as his church, not only that we are his church in our hearts and minds, but as again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, I see that Paul is helping us understand the philosophy of, of God's church. Now he says, if you are the temple of God, if you are his sanctuary, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, he says, for we are now, what? We are God's fellow workers. That's what he says. Is you are fellow players in that football game, not just the observers sitting and watching the game. Now, Paul says, it is time for us to be the ones running with the ball. It is time for us to go into our communities and to say, we are the co-workers with, with Christ. We are there where we are needed. We are there where people need us, need our kind words, need our sympathy, need our empathy, need our, our attention. And we may not always and everywhere now communicate personally, but there is that whole digital universe around us. Pick up the phone, call someone. You are the co-worker with Christ. Start being the disciple, a missionary of Christ, using all those of other available resources. And it is painful that we cannot go and visit people we cannot be in the hospitals now. We cannot be in the nursing homes. But there are ways of reaching out to those people and talking to them. 
You know, when we walk out of the church, it seems like we've done our part. We've finished the church. The worship service ended, and that's the end of our church. Now I'm inviting you to realize church is 24-7. Church is your life. Church is what you do as co-workers with Christ, with God. Because, again, Paul says, you are God's field. That's, where, that, that's that football field where Christ is needing you. He says, you are that field. Go and run. Go and, and do the work that needs to be done. You are God's building, he says again in that same verse. And as we, as we are thinking, we still interact with people. We still go shopping, right? We, we still need eggs and milk and vegan cheese and uh, whatever else you need for your table, for your dinner. As you do that, remember, it's so easy to start a conversation. You can keep that distance. You can be a few feet apart, but people are looking for encouragement. They are looking for support. I, I was at the gas station right here in Ultawa a couple of, day, of days ago, and there was someone right next to me at, at the pump, and I looked, and that, that elderly lady, she did not look happy. There was sadness in, in her eyes and in her face, and, and uh, she was doing whatever she was doing, but it is so easy, and it seems like sometimes it's strange to start the conversation, but I looked at her and said, it was a beautiful day, and I said, what a gorgeous day it is, and she looked up at me, and I felt she needed to talk to someone, and right away, right away, right there, that gas pump, she started talking about her daughter who lost her job, and her daughter, who is struggling without a rent pay, and, and, and uh, uh, she does not know how, what to do with her life, and her daughter has a, a child, and the child is out of school, and she does not know what to do with the child. She kept it all inside, but she was just looking for someone to share that pain. She knew I would not solve her problems. I'm not the president of the United States of America or not put in himself, but she just needed a human being. She needed to talk to someone, and I offered to pray. I could not hold her hand, but we prayed. She was at her pump, and I was at my pump, and we prayed. And that prayer, I believe, what was God wanted to happen at that gas station. This is what being co-workers with Christ is all about. As, as you are driving, you may be in your car, but there may be someone walking in your, neighbor, in your neighborhood. Just, just stop for a moment. You don't need to get out of your car. Roll your window down. Share a few words. Offer a prayer to someone. And, and I know we, we try to avoid any contact, but still, keeping that distance, there is a way to stay in touch with one another. That's what Christ needs today, his church to do. He needs us as his, as his co-workers. Look, the desire of ages. There is a great statement there in page 823. Christ feels the woes of every sufferer. When evil spirits rend the human frame, Christ feels the curse. When fever is burning up in life's current, he feels the agony and he's just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on earth and now listen that's now about us christ's servants are his representatives the channels for his working he desires through them to exercise his healing power that's what being a church is all about stop crying about the church being closed go into your communities and 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 offer whatever you can offer there may be someone needing groceries delivered and just left on the porch of their house or someone needs a, a card mail saying i pray for you or someone needs a phone call someone needs a smile someone needs a wave there are tons, there are billions of ways to minister to the needs of those who are suffering today. Christ needs us as his co-workers. He needs us as his representatives. 
so that the aroma of Christ's presence would be known. It's great when the church is known for its music. It's wonderful when the church is known for its programs and activities or for its awesome building. But also in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, for now, for now we are the aroma of God. That's what our community needs today. That's what our families need today. They need to feel that aroma of Christ's presence around them. As you, when you're hungry and you're passing by some, some restaurant or some kitchen where you feel the aroma of that food that is being cooked. I remember I had lots of Filipinos in one of my churches in when I was pastoring in Atlanta, and they love cooking, and their food is really good. So when they invite you to come and visit, you open the door, and you know you just cannot keep that water filling up your mouth because the aroma, the smell of that food is so great. This is a hungry world around us now, spiritually hungry. They need hope. They need attention. They need love all around us. And I I'm saying today, we need to truly rethink our ministry. Coming to church once a week as we used to do before. Taking our seat and then leaving and leaving God behind and leaving church behind. No more and no longer should be our church. Our church should be me. Being in the community. I need to be that sanctuary of God's presence and God's aroma. Christ came to serve. He came as a servant. This is the spirit of Christ. This is Christ's service. Remember again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, he says, You are his building and you are in his field and you are doing that service of Christ. And that service is about serving others around us. This is an excellent time, great opportunity for us to wake up and to say, yes, my church may be closed. There was a time in my life when I was drafted to serve in the military. And that was the time when I had to rethink my church. I grew up being in my church. I grew up being in my youth group. I grew up meeting weekly in my church and actually three times a week. We had three services. But then being in that communist, atheistic environment of the military, I realized it is time for me to be that church. It is time for me to allow Christ to share the gospel, to preach the gospel through my life through my example, through my words. For two years, this was my only church, the church, the sanctuary, the presence of the Spirit in my life. Let's not be crying today. Let us open our eyes, look up, and realize there are ways that God is waiting for us to explore and to start being creative in our ministry as his church as his sanctuary as his holy sanctuary as his encouraging and blessed sanctuary as his church in our homes for our family members for our spouse for our children for this whole community around us it is by god's power and by god's grace we can do that and we'll be praying for one another i know i've received lots of prayer requests and keep sending those prayer requests. Send them through the day. We'll be sharing them with the prayer chain. This is how we'll be supporting one another. That's how we'll stay together. If you've been watching the broadcast this morning, if you've been a part of this digital service, send me a message also. I'll be sharing it with the church next week. Send me a picture. I want the whole church to know we may be far apart. We may keep the distance. But we are still God's church, each one of us individually, serving God as his co-workers, doing the service of Christ. 
I invite you to pray now. Let's bow our heads. Wherever you are in your homes, you may bow your heads now and present ourselves to God. Our Heavenly Father, we want to rethink our church. Lord, no longer we want to be just the observers watching the game. We want to be in that game. In that game of saving the souls, preaching the gospel, sharing the words of hope, each one of us personally. Lord, because you need me as your temple, and, and, and you need Jeff as your person, and you need David as your person, and you need Judy as your temple, and, and you need Ron as your temple here in our communities, in our neighborhood, in this world, Lord, Teach us, Lord, to embrace this new concept and to go and to be your co-workers, to be your church wherever we are. Let our church's address be where we live. Bless everyone, Lord, to send their prayer requests as they are praying for healing. They're praying for their families, praying for their jobs. They're praying about this world, Lord, and I know you hear these prayers. And today is the day for us, Lord, to wake up and to say, I am your servant. I am your co-worker. Lord, use me for your glory. Use me to bring hope and encouragement to those who may be suffering and struggling today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. At this time, I'm inviting our Sabbath school teachers to come and take uh, those two chairs at this table, and we will be transitioning into our Sabbath school study. I do see even uh, as we are finishing the worship service, uh, many of you are still online, many of you are watching, and praise God for that. So, Jeff and uh, Ron, I know Ron will join us in a moment. I will ask for the microphones. Could we use this microphone? Uh, and uh, we will give them the mics that they need, and we will worship God. And God bless you, those who participated in the worship service. And please continue to study through the week. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to have everyone together for our Sabbath school lesson, even though we're not together. Hopefully everyone has their Bible open to Daniel chapter 12, and your quarterly open to 
Lesson 13, From Dust to Stars. It's been a wonderful lesson on the book of Daniel. I think a very appropriate. Uh, it's interesting that the Sabbath school lessons are chosen about three years before we actually get to one. And how the Lord leads uh, Elder Clifford Goldstein and his team to come up with lessons that exactly fit the time in which uh, we're living. Daniel is, of course, an extremely important book, and I hate to see it come to an end. So I thought for a minute or two, Ron, that I just uh, we just kind of summarize uh, that book. I'd like for each of you to think of what verse or what story or what prophecy in the book has the most meaning to you. And I wish we could share those together. If we were all together, we would, but at least in spirit we can. Interestingly enough, uh, of course, Daniel, the book of Daniel, uh, would, there's no controversy that it is perhaps one of the most important books for Seventh-day Adventists, Daniel and its companion, the book of Revelation. So important. And it's interesting to me, uh, as we kind of summarize the book for a moment, that Jesus commended us to look into the book of Daniel. There in Matthew 24, 15, when he was talking about uh, the signs of the end, he referred to Daniel, and remember how he um, addressed, he uh, identified Daniel, Ron. Yes. The prophet, right? That's right. So, from the Lord's lips himself, we know who the author of Daniel is, and, uh, and how important it is. Um, there are two sections to the book of Daniel, approximately. There are 12 chapters, chapters 1 through 6, and chapters 7 through 12. Two sections. The first section we might uh, term as history or biography, uh, and the second section, uh, prophetic, although we know Daniel 2, of course, is an extremely important prophetic verse. Yes. Something else I thought about was in the first six chapters, Daniel is called upon to interpret dreams from the kings and handwriting on the wall. In the last six chapters, Daniel himself is receiving visions, but he doesn't understand them. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And he even gets sick because he's so worried about it. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And of course, Daniel also is unique in that it is written in two different languages, Ron. Uh, chapter 1 through 2, uh, where do I have that here in my notes? Uh, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, I think, yeah, verse 3 is in Hebrew. Chapter 2, verse 4 to chapter 9, verse 28, the end of chapter 9 is in Aramaic. And then we revert back to Hebrew from uh, the beginning of 8 through uh, the end of, uh, of 12. So we're on chapter 12 now. That's the shortest chapter, only 13 verses. Mm -hmm. But in some ways it's the most controversial because in this short chapter we have three different time prophecies. <laughs> And I'm going to let, Ron is the expert, I'm going to let him handle that tough one of all those three, uh, those three. But let me just, for a moment, summarize the, the chapters. So chapter one, of course, is Daniel and his friends who are standing true to what is right. How much we need that in our modern world in 2020. Uh, it, it, it dealt with diet, but it could have been a death penalty, right, if they had if the king had not seen in them an improvement. You have chapter two, which is Nebuchadnezzar's first dream, the image of, uh, of the different metals and the history of the world. Um, as long as I can remember, every evangelistic series I've ever taught, maybe you too, Pastor Kulikoff, we started with Daniel two. It's so important. If you understand Daniel 2, you have confidence that the Bible is inspired by God. It's not a human book. Chapter 3, of course, is a fiery furnace. And again, standing for what is right. And what is the issue there in chapter 3? It's worship, isn't it? Is that going to be the issue at the end of time? Absolutely. Yes. Wor uh, worship. 
Daniel uh, 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's other dream. What was that dream about, Rod? Right? Well, he had a conversion experience. At the end sure. of it, he did. He <laughs> did. It was amazing. But what was the main thing in that, tra that dream? In chapter 4. Is a tree, right? That's right. A tree. And through this, Nebuchadnezzar is, is converted. But what's so interesting to me is in chapter 2, he had an image of, a vision of the image, but he couldn't remember the dream and certainly not the interpretation. Neither could his wise, so-called wise men. In chapter 4, he remembers the dream, yes. but he has no idea what it means or he has fear about what it means. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very clear what the meaning is, and his wise men didn't dare <laughs> yeah. say, King, you're going to become uh, insane. You know? yeah. So let Daniel well, do it. In the field, yeah, like let, an animal. let Daniel do it. Yeah. Let him <laughs> get the rap for it. <laughs> so then, uh, five, you have Belshazzar's banquet. Yeah. And the Medo Persians taking over the handwriting on the wall. That's right. Whenever somebody says handwriting on the wall, it's a it's a phrase people use today. They're really going back to Daniel chapter five. Yes. Six, you have da Daniel in the lion's den. One of my favorite stories that goes back to kindergarten days. Mine too. But again, a man who could have said, "Well, I'll just pray in my closet quietly," right? <laughs> <laughs> but he was faithful to his God, mm -hmm. and the those jealous men made a fool out of the king. Mm -hmm. I certainly, I'm not being Christian to say it, but I don't blame him for throwing them in the lion's den at the end. They made a fool out of him. Yeah. But Daniel stood for what was right. He did. Uh, eight is the ram and the goat, goat and the horns, the little horn. Daniel, uh, nine is Daniel's wonderful prayer. It's, it reminded me of Jesus' prayer in, in John 17. We don't have any record of sins that Daniel committed. I'm sure he was a sinner. We're all sinners. But he identified himself with his apostate people yes. in his prayer to God. It was a mediatorial uh, incarnation kind of a prayer. Then you have the vision. Um, um, I can't even read my own handwriting. The reason of the vision of the man in 10, you've got the kings of the north and south in 11. I like to skip that one because that one has some difficulty to it. But God's people delivered. You have some questions, Ron. I do have some Good. questions. So, And uh, the folks that are watching us today, uh, I, I, it would be wonderful if we could just interact with each That's other. Right. But I'm going to interact with my brother Jeff here. And so... Uh, I'm just going to go through some of these questions and mm -hmm. we can just kind of uh, answer them. Okay, so my first question is, what kind of stress is coming upon the nations of our earth? Uh, uh, have we ever had this kind of stress prior to this time of Earth's history? What are your thoughts on that, brother? Well, um, chapter 12 begins with, uh, with Michael and with this time of distress or time of trouble that has never happened before. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Pastor Peter talked about uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, issue this morning. Uh, I don't think it's one of the seven last plagues, do no. you, Rod? No, I don't think <laughs> But I think that it's, it's a wake up. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a wake up call. It's a, it's a prelude to it. Yes. We know there's a time when we cannot buy or sell, right? That's right. Right now, if you want to go buy a suit, could you do it? You yeah. can. No, you can. If you want to go to a restaurant with your friends and eat, you can. You can do it. Now, fortunately, good things about this is even the bars and the sporting uh, events are closed, but if somebody wants to go to the bar and drink, they can. But Praise that's it. <laughs> that's right. But that sets a precedent, I think, Ron. For a day when there may be a law that says, okay, nobody went to church back in 2020. Now only this group that's not cooperating with it, we will put a law that they cannot yes. worship. Yes. It's about worship again, isn't it? It is. In a sense. So, yeah, a time of trouble such as never has been. Yeah. Um, I'm only 76 now, so there's a lot of life I haven't learned about yet. But I've never in my life been through an experience that we're having right now. Yes. And maybe you would say May the I same. I never have. <laughs> this is something new. <laughs> and 
it happened so quickly, right? It did. A month ago, the stock market was the highest it's ever been. Now it's heading toward the basement. Mm -hmm. Gasoline in some places is under a dollar a gallon. Who could have thought about something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people running to and fro, and suddenly they're not running to and fro. Yes. Right. So. Uh, I think what we're living in right now is a prelude to Daniel 12, mm -hmm. and what Daniel was saying here in the first verse, don't you think? I it's not a seven last plague. No. God is gonna bring those. And the interesting thing is, in Egypt there were 10 plagues, weren't they? The first three, God's people were involved in them too, but the last, the seven last plagues in Egypt only went on to the wicked. The seven last plagues we're gonna see are only on the wicked. Right. So this is not, <laughs> we are agreed this is not one of the seven last place. That's right. All right, your next That's question. Right. So, uh, okay. Anyway, we're told that Michael, yes. uh, the great prince, will rise and stand up. Yes. And uh, we're told that he will protect a certain group of people. Yes. What people? Who is, who is he talking about? Well, I wonder first, who is this Michael? Yes, that's a good question. Who is this Michael? Who is this Michael? Um, Sharon and I visited a, a, a young man in a maximum security prison in Colorado. We're the only human beings he sees other than, than, uh, than prison guards. And he studies his Sabbath school lesson every week. And he had this question for us recently. Who is Michael? So I told him, look at uh, Sunday's lesson for this week. Yes. And, I, and then a lesson two or three days ago also dealt with Michael. Michael is who? It's Ross. Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now how do you explain that when it says he is an angel? He's an archangel. Well, he's kind of like the head of the angels, more or less. He was. He was chosen to be a leader of the angels. That's right. Well, an angel, angel means messenger. Mm -hmm. So there are heavenly angels that are created beings. They're different than us human beings. Right. We can be angels when we go and visit someone or yeah. put a sack of groceries on their front porch or give them a phone call or write them a note. But Jesus is the ultimate messenger between earth and heaven, isn't he? That's right. And I, to answer your question specifically, in the first 11 chapters here in Daniel, a heathen king is the focus. Mm -hmm. Here in chapter 12, verse 1, Michael stands up That's right. for his people. That's right. And Michael is the one who stood up for Moses there in Jude 9. Remember? Right. Disputed. Devil says, no, Moses is my man. Michael, the prince, says, no, he's my man. And Jesus will stand up for you and me just like he did for, for uh, Moses. Mm -hmm. But I, I watched uh, Doug Basher last night on the Sabbath School Hour. And it's very interesting. He said when a, when a judge stands up in his court, mm -hmm. he's not ready for more testimony. Yeah. He's ready to make a judgment, right? Sure. And he had this illustration. Let's say, you maybe remember this as a youngster, you were... You were sitting around the fireplace in the evening. Father was in the easy chair reading the newspaper, and you and your siblings were playing, and suddenly you sort of got to fighting. Now, maybe that didn't happen to you. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it happened I'm to sorry me. to say we fought. And Dad puts the newspaper down, and he says, if you don't stop, I'm going to get up. <laughs> and they knew that if Dad got up out of his easy chair, it meant there was a judgment time, which might mean a switch or a belt or something. Right. So when Michael here stands up, yes. he's saying it's enough, devil, of, right. of, dis of fighting my people, of killing my people, of, of pressuring my people to follow you. The book of Daniel here is like the rock in chapter 2, isn't it? Yes. It comes and destroys the rest, and God That's sets right. up his eternal kingdom. So, and God's people are those who follow ah, the Michael, yes. the son of God. You know, yes. And those who truly love him, and those who are willing to stand up for what is right, and those who will be faithful mm -hmm. to the very end. Those are God's people, and he will protect them. Okay? That's why the stories in chapter 1 of the diet, of chapter 3 of 
not bowing down to the image mm -hmm. of chapter five, the lion's den, are not just biography. No, that's right. <laughs> they are illustrating to us the rest is prophecy telling us where we are in the stream of time and what the devil is doing to lead the world in, in the apostasy. Right. But we have to have the character of following Michael, right? right? Following the shepherd. That's it. If we don't follow the shepherd, we get lost. That's right. And we, will get lost. And we cannot find our way back on our own. No. Isn't that true? That's exactly Can anybody right. get back on their own? No way. No. We're saved by grace. That's right. Not by our own. That's right. You have another question. All right. I have a, another uh, thought here for sure. So it says that he will stand up at this time. He will arise. But what time are we talking about, Jeff? What is this time okay, that's a that good, we're talking about? That's a good question because actually 10, 11, and 12 deal with the very same yes. vision that Daniel had. Mm -hmm. You have the the, the ram and the goat, you have the king of the north and the king of the south fighting against God's people in the middle. Mm -hmm. So Daniel's big worry was, we have to remember that when Daniel was written, God's people had been captives. I mean, Daniel 12, 1 verse, uh, 12 verse, I mean, Daniel 1 verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Jerusalem. That's right. And took the people captive and killed the people and destroyed the city. Yes. And Daniel is worried about when will God's name be vindicated? When yes. will God's people be able to worship freely without a death penalty again, right? That's exactly so that's, I think that's where we stand here. We stand at the very end of time. Yes. But what is so amazing to me in this chapter is Daniel doesn't understand it. Yeah. And why doesn't he? Because a couple, 1260 years has to pass, That's right. plus 500 years, yeah. right? plus 500, That's right. about 2300 years before we're ready to yeah. understand it, isn't yeah. it? Good? Because time. That's amazing, so much time yeah. needs to pass by before we can fully understand it. But God knows the end from the beginning. That's a question I can never answer, so I throw it over to you. Why do we have to have so much time go by? Well, we have to have so much time because there are, there are prophecies, okay? And these prophecies have to come, they have to be fulfilled. And so, and we've seen that happen, we Yeah. Time has gone by, and truly, times, times, and a half time has gone by. And when did this time start? Can you tell me that? Well, we have... Uh, we have three time prophecies in this chapter, but okay. I think we're looking at primarily 538. Yes, to 1798. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think God's patience and God's love and God's mercy is involved. Right. We also have to remember that this great controversy does, is focused on this world, but it's a, it's a controversy that encompasses the whole universe. Mm -hmm. The whole universe is looking at this. Satan right or is God right? You know, yes, that's that right. whole thing. And, that's and so it has to play out. out. Yeah, it has to play out. Right. It has to play out. Now what's so amazing here in chapter 12 is knowledge will be increased. increased. <laughs> that's right. Knowledge will be increased. That's what we see in, in amazing ways in our time right now, isn't it? Yes. Now there's several things there isn't it? <clears throat> One of the knowledge is, we've always said science and industry and so forth, and, and there's a statistic that says that 90% of all scientists are alive today, of all time. 90% are alive today. We see uh, innovations of every kind. It's just amazing. And in our lifetime, of course, the computer and, and, and communications and all. But that is extremely important for God's message to get to every nation, That's kindred, right. tongue, and people, isn't That's it? Right. So he says, when his message goes to all the world, yes. then the end will yes. come. Yes. So it, it must not be quite there yet. Yeah. But I know we're close. 
Yeah, we sometimes look at, well, uh, we have to have more evil, more pestilences, like Renora values and more wars and so forth, but that's not it. You hit the nail on the head. Jesus said, when everyone hears, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And today we have that. Mm -hmm. I do some work for Adventist World Radio. We work, we reach into the most unreachable countries of the world, the Arab countries, the communist countries, and others, with radio. Mm -hmm. People can listen with earbuds in their ears because believe it or not, there are countries today where just like in Daniel's day, if you were caught listening to Christian material, yeah. or if your father finds out you have embraced Christianity, you may be dead. That's right. That's true. That's right. We have a 3 mbn we have Hope Channel, we have all these other wonderful ministries that are getting behind locked doors in apartment buildings where nobody can go door to door as we, you know, 50, 60 years ago they sold fuller brushes and everything door to door, didn't they? You can't do that anymore, but you can still get to the people, which is the basic point. Yeah. And it seems to me knowledge being increased in 2020, Ron, we as a church, we're not the biggest church out there, but we have the biggest, the broadest message to give out. With the technology we have and the dedicated technicians and engineers who can broadcast our pastors' sermons and so forth, mm -hmm. we can get to every nation, yes. kindred, yes. tongue, and people. What is so amazing right now is we're doing a lot of Bible studies over cell phones. Because mm -hmm. there's WhatsApp, there's other apps in other parts of the world, that everybody in, in China is very true. Everybody's listening to. So you send a Bible study to your 10 friends. They send it to their 10 friends. They send it to their 10 friends. Suddenly, exponentially, we're getting the message to everyone, just like Daniel 12 said we need to That's do. That's right. And all of this is being fulfilled. It must be fulfilled at this time. Yes. This time. The time of the end. That's right. What's your next test? So uh, here's question. another um, what, what special thing in your mind, Jeff, what special thing is God going to do for his people? What, what is he going to do? It says, everyone whose name is written in the book of life. Of life. Yes. And that's Revelation 3, 5. Yes. Everyone whose name is written in the book of life will be what? Will be delivered. Yes. Amen? Yes. God's yes. people yes. will be delivered. Now, we mentioned the book. So what is the book and how will these people be delivered? How is God going to deliver his people? Well, the books, uh, book and books of heaven is an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. When we were kids, we understood that very well because every, all kinds of material was recorded in books. Today it's recorded on computers. Yeah. yeah. So we might say God's computers. Yeah. But anyway, we understand from our computer age that the federal government has every one of our names and our social security number and our history oh, and everything yes. else. They have all those records. So does the, te the uh, credit card company and everybody else. Mm -hmm. So certainly God has. Mm -hmm. And it's so amazing that God knows our name. Yeah. Isaiah says, He's written our name on the palms of his hands. There's scars there for what he did for us. So God knows us. And there's another book, of course, Ron, too. Okay. The Book of Life and the Book of Death. Yes. We want our names in the Book of Life. Absolutely. And what we see here, I think, and to try to answer your question, he's, Daniel was worried about being delivered out of Babylon. Sure. We're going to be delivered out of Babel, Babylon, Rebel, it's still, Babel and Babylon have always been a false human system to take the place of God's true system. Yes. Absolutely. We're going to be delivered out of that. Yes. That's what uh, Daniel 12 is telling us here. That's right. We want our names written in the book of life because in the book of life, the sins that may have been recorded against our name, which are many, have been blotted out. God's white out is his blood, isn't it? That's right. It's, they're gone. Forgotten. They're in the depths of the sea. The devil tries to get us to remember them sometimes. We are well to remember God has forgotten them. Why are we still? Yes. That's right. Yes, that's right. So, and then you, do you have a question about this, uh, the resurrection? Yeah. 
Well, that is an it, interesting it one. It says that everyone whose name is written in the book will be delivered. And uh, when we come to the thought on the resurrection, now let's talk about that for a moment, the resurrection. And we want to be in the resurrection. Yes. Or uh, unless we're going to be translated. Yes. You know, and that's a possibility. But nevertheless, it's important that we be a part of the resurrection. Because what is what exciting thing is going to happen when the time of the resurrection comes? It says you will call our names, right? Yes. From the dust of the earth. And we will rise. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive will remain. We'll be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. But what an exciting, fantastic day that is going to be. Well, there's something interesting here. In this resurrection that's recorded here in, uh, in uh, chapter 12, verse 2. Yes. There's two aspects to this. There's a resurrection um, for multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will right. awake, mm -hmm. some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, this is this is a special what we call a special resurrection. Yes. It's a special resurrection. There are two groups of people being resurrected here. This is not the final end no. at all. These are two groups who have a, a special need to see physically Jesus come back again, right? That's right. The first group is those who, since the Great Awakening in the 1840s, have preached and looked forward to the second coming. And it, it, it's even in our name, Adventist. We yeah. are looking for the second advent of Christ. But what about this second group, Ron? Who are they? Well, the... I mean, you, you said that uh, everyone needs to see. Now, is the, the Bible says that every eye will see him when he comes. Yes. So is that not part of the second group there, that those who crucified yes. him yeah. on the cross are going to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven? Now, they'll go back, you know, again, and then it comes into the resurrection. But this group is a group that has the opportunity, which God wants them to have the opportunity, to see him coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus said it there at his trial, when he was adjured to declare that he was the Savior, and he said, yes, and you will see me coming. So I think Pilate and, and Caiaphas, not necessarily all of those soldiers who were simply following orders, yeah. but the Jewish leaders, wouldn't you think? who would not believe in Jesus, even though with the miracles and all the rest, he totally fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, right? right. That he right. was, they're going to see him, like you said, but they're, they're not resurrected to eternal life. They're resurrected to death. They're going to, at some time during that Jesus coming, they're going to be destroyed again by the brightness of his coming, don't you think? Yeah, they cry for the rocks and yeah. the mountains, the yeah. fall on them, Revelation yeah. chapter 6. But they are going to be witnesses because it was in a courtroom that Jesus was condemned unjustly. Right. And this is a courtroom scene here too. Michael stands up. That's right. But this is a courtroom scene where it's not, we're not giving evidence anymore. Mm -hmm. We're receiving the opinion, the judgment of the judge. Yes. Right? That's right. <laughs> So, That's yeah, right. I, this is amazing. Even though this is the smallest chapter in Daniel, it's got some really heavy Powerful. stuff in it. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 there, um, it says these words, Those who are wise uh, yeah. shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. I mean, the heavens are going to light up when Jesus comes. Yes. No question about that with all of his you know, millions of angels coming with him. Uh, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like, like the, the stars, stars forever and ever. Yeah. So I guess we're all going to light up, <laughs> you know, but in a sense, like the stars. But what a glorious day. That's well, it's see. the title of our lesson this week, From Dust to Stars. Yes. Those that sleep in the dust shall rise. 
shine yeah, like the stars or whatever. Like the star. uh, right. It's a beautiful, we can say the words, we can't comprehend no. what that all means. Oh, no. We do know that we'll have the opportunity to travel to all the stars. Oh, we? yes, yes, yes. And a sense we will be, we wouldn't say stars like Hollywood stars, but we're going to be exhibit A's of God's grace, aren't we? That's right. Every one of us there are going to be different from the billions of peop other people in the universe because we are all redeemed, yes. right? By the blood of the lamb. the lamb, of the creator of the universe. That's right. Uh, it's interesting that sometimes I've always thought, well, it's going to be so amazing in heaven to sit down next to Moses and Paul and, mm -hmm. and Stephen and Mary Magdalene and ask them what it was like to be with Jesus. But someone reminded me the opposite is going to be the fact. Those people are going to sit down next to us who yes. lived at the end of time and say, what was it like <laughs> going right. through the seven last plagues? What was it like when Michael stood up That's for right. you? That's right. <laughs> So right. we're going to all be sharing some wonderful things, and it's glad, it, time will be no more, so we won't run out of time, Ron. No, <laughs> no, 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 no more clocks. <laughs> but you know it's amazing, because you were talking about traveling through space, and you know, um, I've been told, we've been told, that we would get to heaven in seven days. Yes, you know, right. Really right. And in order to do that in seven days, uh, we would have to be traveling because the open space in Orion is nine quadrillion miles away, okay? I mean, it's a humongous number. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to be traveling, and we're going to have to travel many times the speed of light. The speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, okay? But we're going to be traveling many times that number in order to get there in seven days. What an exciting time going through space. All and all of those constellations, by the way, tell the story. You know, the constellation, every constellation yeah. tells a story of God's plan to save you and me forever. Amen. Even those fellows who like to speed around in Corvettes and so <laughs> yeah. forth. Oh, it's, it's, right. it's not going to be any, no, no. anything like that at all. That's exactly right. Um, you have, how about... Let me ask you a tough question, oh, Ron. Go ahead. How about this business of this book being sealed? We touched on that a little bit, a bit ago. But why is Daniel sealed? Yeah, why are the, why are the, yeah, why? Because he was told, yeah. seal up the books yes. until the time of the end. Now I have a question back for you. <laughs> <laughs> so have those books been opened yet? Uh -oh. Do you think? Absolutely. 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 Since... 1798 is the time of the end beginning. Yes. We see the great advent movement in the early 1800s. All over the world. It wasn't just in America. It wasn't just in New England. It was all of South America, Europe, all over the world. This book began to be unsealed. And to unseal Daniel, you have also unseal Revelation. The two books... You know that wonderful book That's by Uriah right. Smith, Daniel and Revelation. That's right. The two books explain each other. And of course, you, you need Ezekiel, you need Isaiah, you need the Psalms, you need a lot of other books. But uh, the knowledge, when we, we talked earlier about knowledge being increased and we talked about science and so forth, but really what Daniel 12 is talking about, knowledge increasing, mean, meaning run to and fro, that Hebrew word means to study the word, to look back and forth. I don't understand this in Revelation. I'll go back to Jeremiah, and I'll help, uh, it'll tell me how that word was used there will help me understand how it's used here. So it's comparing Scripture with Scripture, which has been a key to Seventh-day Adventists, yes. to understand the Bible. Let the Bible interpret itself. Right. Right? Right. So the knowledge being increased had to happen at the end of the 1260 year period, 1798, and we look at 1844, but 1844, in 1844, there was an extremely amount of knowledge that had been increased yes. in the last few decades That's to right. that time, wasn't That's it? Right. And of course it's increased since then too. Yeah. But uh, how frustrating that would have been to Daniel. I mean, just think of Daniel for a minute. He stood before Nebuchadnezzar, 
and he explained the dream. Yes. He stood before Nebuchadnezzar again and said, King, you're that tree. It gets cut down. You're going to wander around like a beast and so forth. And that took courage. Yes, it did take courage. Uh, Belshazzar says, what's this handwriting on the wall? Yeah. Bring Daniel in, this old, old man. Yeah. And he wants to give him all this. He said, keep it for yourself. You're not going to live the night through. That's but he explains the handwriting on the wall. But here, Daniel has had his own visions, yeah. but he doesn't understand it. And Lord says, Daniel, be patient. You will stand at the end. I, don't you think Daniel will be in that special resurrection? Oh, he I, has to be, don't I you? I think so. <laughs> He's the one who will get the most out of it, really. Right. Be patient. There's got to be the fulfillment of various things that the the little horn has to grow. The universe needs to see the true character of Satan's kingdom. Yes. Right? That's right. And it took a couple thousand years. We thought, Sharon and I were talking about how terrible it would have been to live between 538 and 1798. Millions of Christians that were killed for their faith. That's right. 60 million. That's right. The Bible was outlawed. Yeah. If you were caught with this book, That's right. you were imprisoned and probably killed. This was a, a capital offense to hold even a portion. That's right. Even a portion. That's right. Even the Warren seas had to endure that. Exactly. Didn't. That's why they went to the mountains to yeah. live in the mountain. They taught their That's right. children the scriptures so that they could carry them out as they grew older to other people. Well, let me ask you a question. All right. Uh, in Joel, it talks about 238, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, our young men and our old men having yes, visions yes, and yes, dreams yes. and so forth. Do you believe in your heart? Because I know. <laughs> Do you believe that God has a, God wants us, He expects us to be lights in this world, to carry this message? Yes. But as we receive these visions and these dreams, to carry it out to the world, which is part of the latter rain. Mm -hmm. God's people will be great instruments. God will be using them as channels of blessing to reach the world out there. Yes. And this morning, I know you and I plead with the world that the world will give their hearts to Christ because we're living so close to the end of time. We need to be ready for that. Yeah, I, one of my prayers in this uh, COVID-19 thing is that this will lead people to think of eternity. Absolutely. Yes. Fortunately, one good thing, as we said earlier, Ron, the bars are closed. <laughs> now, I guess they can get drive up alcohol and so forth. But if people yeah. would turn to the word of God, Amen. if you turn to the evening news, if you turn to the news magazines or the newspapers, you're going to be down. Yeah. I mean, people, the Bible says heart, men's hearts failing them for fear, and we see right. that today. We're we seeing, we're seeing and, that. and people acting irresponsibly. I mean, going out and loading up on toilet paper, for oh, example. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Why do we need to do, there's no shortage of that unless you no. hoard it, and, yeah. and there's no great need for it. But People need a solid rock to stand That's on, it. and that is the Word of God. That is correct. That is the Word of God. That is the yeah. solid rock. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let me go on to another thought yeah. here, should I? Uh, do you think that Daniel and his companions fit the above description, those who were shy? Daniel fit that. Daniel and his, and his friends have fitted that. Right? Those who are, what did you say, shy? Those who oh, are, those. who shine, oh, shine. like the brightness right. of his firmament. Yes. That yes. Daniel and his Hebrew friends were like yes. that. Yes. They were shining. Now, the question is, do you think God wants us then, in these hours of hmm. Earth's history, to shine, to be lights in this world where there's so much darkness? Well, you hit on the important point there. If you put a candle out in the bright sunshine, it doesn't do much. But if it's in a totally darkened room, we're going to shine like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did right. when it's the darkest. Yeah. Right? Right. 
In, in that case, it's not necessarily physical darkness. It's darkness about the true character of God and his truth. Yes. We have the opportunity because the devil's um, counterfeit uh, confessing our sins to a human being. Yes. Purgatory, the worship of, of Mary, the worship of idols, and the yes. worship of of anything other than God. For many people, it's sports. Yeah. It's it's it is. frivolity. It's it is. it's drinking at the bar and so forth. And that's why I'm hoping maybe some way through this, as we shine, our shine, our light can be more visible than it might be in a time when our country wasn't in such a, a crisis. Yeah. Now, the question also is, if if God wants us to shine as lights in the darkness, as you mentioned. And the time will come. There'll be a time of trouble such as never was upon the face of the earth, but God's people will be delivered. Now, sh should we not have had some of those experiences oh. in our life yeah. prior to that time yes. when we have gone through experiences where we had to stand up for what, is, what was right? And if we're just sitting back and we're not standing up for what's right when this like this virus going around, are we going to be ready to be shining lights for him when we have, darkness really comes upon this world? We have to be victorious over the little, so-called, yes, little challenges, little temptations, right. or we won't stand during the biggest. That's the deal I'm saying. That's right. Uh, we see that so often in scripture, you know. Uh, Judas, the Lord worked with Judas, probably harder than any other disciple. Yes. And Judas would let that greediness foment in his body until he came to the point of something he would have never wanted to do. Yes. To, the the uh, to deny his master. And then to go out and, and commit suicide, you know, terrible, terrible thing. Yes. But it seems like Peter, Peter also had his faults. But Peter, I think, was willing to address those faults. He was. When Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, Peter could have taken that personally and gone away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. He didn't. No. And so when he denied his Lord, he went out and confessed that. So to answer your question, Ron, we need victories each day. Absolutely. But we need to pray for those victories. Oh, yes. Because we can't, like we said, we can't do it alone. And realize that with God's blessing, if we gain the victory over this sin, the Lord will have something else for us to work on next. Oh, but true. it's giving us strength. It's strengthening our, our spiritual muscles, just like exercise spiritual, uh, strengthens our physical muscles That's right. to do more Amen. in the future. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now our time is drawing near, as you can see, mm -hmm. the in front of us. But let's what have let's, we not yet here? Let's see. Let me go through some of my notes here. We have the we, we have the twelve. Let's say a word about this. Uh, the um, thirteen hundred thirty-five and the twelve hundred ninety years. Okay. Um, Doug Maxwell had a chart last night. I was wishing we had that chart this morning. But the, the 1290 is 30 years more, and that goes back to 508 when that starts, and that is when Clovis became king of, of France, of the Franks, and converted to the Catholic faith. And that set it up for 538. And then the, uh, the 1335 bring us down to 1843. That's just before the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. So, and uh, there are different views on this. I think, to me, our lesson makes the most sense about these. We have to remember, Ron, from our history, that God gives us prophecy so that when it happens, we will yes, know. Yes, that's right. When we start saying, well, I think this is going to happen down here, or the Lord's going to come in 2026, or something like that. We're in deep trouble. We yeah. shouldn't be sending time. We should understand it as best we can, compare scripture with scripture. So when it happens, that's what we've seen in this whole 
book closed until the end of time, 1798, and this great expansion of knowledge about the book of Revelation, about the book of, of Daniel, yeah. and their, uh, their commingling to help us understand. So, so yes, those three time prophecies. And then this wonderful last verse, but you, for you, this, he's, God is talking, Michael, God is talking directly to Daniel. Go your way until the end. You will rest. And then, the Lord didn't say you're going to heaven right now, did he? He said you're going to sleep, you're going to rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Isn't that beautiful? Now when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. They each had their allotments, didn't they? Yes. Their parts of the, of the land. Here, God is saying to Daniel, you're going to have an allotment, Daniel. Uh, Ron, you're going to have an allotment. Jeff, you're going to have an allotment. You're going to have your mansion. <laughs> Maybe we can live next door to each other. Yeah. That'd be great. But we're also going to have a place in the country. That's right. <laughs> we're going to like that, too. But it seems to me the Lord is saying, be patient, David Daniel, and we forget sometimes, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The patience is a very important part of that. Let's uh, pray. Yes. We come to the end of it. Yes, program. you pray for us, Ron. Wonderful, loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Amen. Uh, we're inspired by it. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to be faithful to be shining lights like the, like the brightness of the Amen. firmament, firmament Amen. like the stars, Heavenly Father. And I pray that others will come to Christ yes. as you work through us. So bless us, we pray, and keep us faithful during this dark time, even that we're going through Amen. now. Help us to keep looking up and to encourage each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.